four-time Disc Golf Pro Tour winner and your 2022 USDGC champ, Gannon Burr now joins Tour Life. Gannon, welcome back, brother. I feel like it was not that long ago that we were talking with you. Yeah, not long at all. Uh, how, I guess first initial thoughts uh, after an incredible tournament and really honestly, like one of the more exciting finishes that I can remember. Uh, how, how are you feeling? Well, uh, that last round was very stressful for me, obviously. Um, but now that it's over with, it uh, kind of kind of gives me almost a clear head for the rest of this like kind of first half of the season. Um, I think every year, honestly, I'm going for, you know, if I can get anywhere from two to four pro tour wins, I, I'm pretty happy. So uh, having one through two events already is amazing. Uh, and that way, you know, if I don't win any of the next five events, it's okay because I got this one. But uh, I think it'll help me be a little more relaxed and uh, knowing I already got the job done. It's already, you know, one box checked off already. So uh, I think I'll be able to play a little more relaxed and confident uh, moving forward. Did you find that by them adding a new course this year, it made it to where maybe in the past people have kind of looked and, you know, they've said wacky Waco of where we see some guys pop off. Uh, you know, we've seen winners like Colt Montgomery, the one year where it was only two rounds instead of three, we've seen Nate Perkins almost win this event multiple times, big germs, another name that gets close to winning his event. These are names that we aren't really necessarily seeing in the top 10 week after week. Do you think them adding Lake Waco, do you think that helped kind of make it to where it wasn't as crazy of seeing some of these names jump up the leaderboards? Terms won it oh. twice, not almost. Just kidding. Oh yeah, you're right. He did win it twice. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Perkins was the one that almost won it twice. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah it's, I mean, I always enjoy having two courses. I think it's, it's I think it's more fun. It's definitely more of a challenge. Uh, obviously, the Beast has more woods than the Lake Course did, um, but yeah, the Lake Course offered a little more, of, a little more of a you know open variety, kind of more of a placement golf, which I really enjoy and I feel like I perform well in the past. That is, uh, you know, when a course gives you a lot of a lot of room to throw, but you know you still got to pick your correct landing zones and your shot shaping abilities and stuff like that. Um, it worked out really well. I mean, I can already think, you know, a couple holes just on the front nine of Lake Waco really suit my throwing style uh, with like, I think six, seven, eight, were all flex lines out of the hand with drivers that you kind of, I kind of just like yank them over and then, and then they get that nice fade back. Um, and I, I bullseye three in a row in that final round to, uh, I think, put me six down through eight holes. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, I think that course played really well in my game. And then it was really the first time I was able to play solid at the beast. Uh, I had a, it was really my first breakout performance in 2021, but um, I think I got 11th in 2021, which is my best finish ever at Waco before this. Other than that, okay. it's always been kind of a, a rough tournament for me. I've got like 24th and 25th. So definitely kind of below what I'm looking for. Uh, but then this year I was able to play solid at the beast. Mainly I just started off hot. I feel like in the front nines, uh, which just makes it way easier to get a couple more birdies in the back nine and just to put together a, you know, nine down to 11 down round. Yeah. The, the beast is such an interesting course because you can almost play identical from, from one day to the next, but you're off just a little bit on one, on a couple shots, a couple holes, and it turns birdies and pars into bogeys and doubles. There's a couple holes where you're like, man, if I get a bad kick here, this could turn into a, a disaster number. So it, it does play a, a little interesting there. I do want to run through some of these stats though. We, uh, we now have, you know, stats provided by stats Mando, who is now, I guess, owned by the disc golf pro tour, or I guess owned by the PDG. I'm not sure exactly which one, but PDGA. here's some PDG. Here's some stats for you. You were number one in total putts made over a thousand four hundred feet of total putts made. You were first in the average putt, putt make. Almost 20 feet was your average putt distance. You were first in strokes gained putting at 9.3. You were first in strokes gained from circle two at 5.2. You were seventh in strokes gained from C1X at 4.10. Uh, and you went 42 of 47 for 89% from C1X and 11 of 25 from 44% from C2. 
playing these courses and some of these holes and honestly, Lake Waco, there's a couple holes, right? Hole six, hole seven, hole 16. There's a handful of holes where it's like your best shot is landing 40 feet from the basket. Do you think your putting really had like a huge impact on your finish just by how hard it was to get to the basket on a lot of these holes off the tee? Um, so, well, I ended up making five circle two putts in the third round, uh, through 12 holes, I believe. So, um, I I think part of it was a little bit of a momentum thing. And part of it was was absolutely disgusting. Yeah. (laughs) Like every other hole, just making a circle two putt. Like, yeah. (laughs) And then part of it was, I was also just getting more under par. Um, that third round, I started off eight under on the front nine. Uh, my, my card was kind of disgusting that round. We went 42 under as a card, oh. which is just insane. Uh, we had two 11s and two 10s with me, Greg, Nate, and, uh, Mason Ford. Mason. Wow. Yeah. So very, very, it was, I mean, just good, good time all around. But I, I think I, I kept landing just like a little bit outside the circle and I putted really, really bad at Memorial. Um, obviously and chess.com. I did not put good at, um, kind of, like I said, just getting used to the new putters, which I'm putting with the, the link right now. And I definitely worked on my, I don't, I wouldn't say I did too many practice putts, but I more worked on trying to find a stroke that felt comfortable. And once I found it, it actually made putting really easy. I remember, um, I remember the first day of practice, I was like, hey, I'm actually kind of putting good now. And I had this little step putt I was doing, uh, step through, I guess, I'd putt and then step with my left foot um, on just outside circle putts or like anything from like, obviously, anything circle two pretty much. Uh, Unless it was a death putt, I want to take some pace off, then I just do my normal putt and kind of loft it up there. Um, But yeah, I mean, the momentum was there. I don't know, I feel like once I get in the position where I'm near the top of a, of the tournament, uh, I do pretty, pretty good about keeping it there or even closing out. And so once I could kind of like see the door getting cracked open, even in the third round, just seeing my name at the top and kind of being in control of the tournament from then on, uh, like it just gives me more confidence to get more birdies and make more putts. But it, the putting definitely saved me. If I would have missed those putts, I probably would have shot a mediocre round, maybe thrown a couple even worse drives. Um, but yeah, I saved par a couple of times with some deep circle two putts and that that's always a big momentum booster. Cause you're not dropping strokes on the tour. I made a joke on, uh, Joe I said, if he got better at driving off the tee, his scores would not change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is, that is probably which accurate, is, which is kind of crazy to think about if you're making five from circle two and you just park them, like you're still shooting. Yep. And not, nothing, under, nothing under. really changes too much. Let's so obviously about- that's not true, but. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk about this excessive time violation that was called. This is not something that we often see. And you guys had being lead card. You guys had a marshal with you that I guess was paying attention to pace of play. Now, was that just your first warning that or had he mentioned anything to you prior? Because this, I believe, was your third shot on hole ten, the par five. Second, yeah, second shot. Second shot. Yeah. Uh, no, nothing was mentioned to me beforehand. I wasn't even notified. I was playing slow. I don't think I was at all. Uh, what killed me is I looked at, I went to my disc, looked at my shot, went to talk to my caddy for like 20 seconds to to figure out what disc to throw. And that whole time my clock is running, even though I'm not even by my disc or really, you know, deciding what I want to throw. Uh, and then after I threw the shot, which I think by the time I guess I grabbed my disc and, and thrown the shot, it was around like 20, 25 seconds. Um, but I'd already gone over because of the talking to the caddy part, which mm. I'm not a huge fan of. And I, I, I tried to talk to him about, there's a, there was also a clip of me trying to discuss with him, like, when does my time start yep. uh, and stuff like that. I never, I never got a good answer. Um, I've heard many he, different he answers. He didn't say, okay, that's kind of crazy. Cause I feel like it's pretty simple. Like your time starts when it's a now, like when it's basically made apparent that you're the next one to throw and you have had yeah. adequate time to address your lie, yeah, whether, so- whether you've addressed your lie or not, as long as like, if you're, if you're like slow, you know, moonwalking to your disc, 
right? To take way more time than you should. I feel like that should count, but uh, yeah, that feels like that shouldn't be necessarily a gray area, but they didn't give you a straight answer there. No, and I've gotten so many, obviously I've had problems with being slow in the past. Um, that round, I don't even think it was, I was slow at all. And no one on my card really did either. Um, yeah, I asked him like, okay, so when is my time starting? He's like, once you mark your disc, I'm like, okay, what if I don't mark my disc? He's like, no, when you approach your lie, okay, what if I'm five feet to the right of my lie? Okay, well, you're still, it's still your turn. I'm like, oh, okay, so what is it? And then I've heard when you grab your disc out of your bag, that's when your time starts. I've heard so many different things. Uh, like the funniest part too. Oh, Keep going, yeah. I'll, well, I'll just say the, the funny part too is, uh, and not to pick on Nate Sexton, but the shot right after my time violation Terry Miller's reading off the the rule of time violation yep. and and they took 45 seconds on his next shot and nothing was called. <laughs> and so I just is like a little frustrating on why, you know, in my opinion, I understand it's a rule, but if, it, if that's what the rule is and they're so serious about it, you need to call it for uh, everybody, obviously, but there, there shouldn't even be a little bit of leeway. It's like, Hey, that's 30 seconds. Like maybe, you know, you had a couple like, close calls or maybe you did go over it a couple times but the, the person just never told you well like that's wrong no if you broke 30 seconds one time then you technically broke the rule like there should be no like oh we'll give you a couple times that that doesn't say says nowhere in the rule so I it's foresee, like, yeah i foresee this rule changing i foresee because the way the way to progress i don't want to see a gannon burr stressed out like he has a let's say you have a super big shot coming up I don't want to see you stressed out and have to just grab something and chuck it without thinking about yeah. it. Um, there are certain instances, for example, walking up to a 15 foot putt. If you're walking up to a 15 foot putt and you take 45 seconds, that's a problem. But if you're in an area and you have a decision to make, should I go for it over in two or should I lay up? And there's thought pro there's stuff going on that to me as a viewer, I'm interested. I'm invested. I want to yeah. hear what you're saying to the caddy. It's a big shot. You know, I don't want to see you take 45 seconds out of 15 foot putt. Those yeah. two things are very different. And that's why I think the rule will eventually change to where it's a pace of play as a group. And as long as you're keeping, uh -huh. as long as you're keeping up and, and playing quickly as a group, that's fine because I could take five seconds on a lot of my shots and then I can take a minute on a very, very tough, tricky shot where I'm trying to figure out how to scramble yeah. and I can play faster than someone that's taking 30 seconds every single time. Yeah. And that was like, that's another thing too, is like, I'm actually very, very quick getting to my disc yep. for my next shot. And it almost makes me like worse because if you take my total time from T pad to my next shot, including the time it takes me to throw that next shot. It's actually fairly quick in total because I got to my disc really quick. So my pace of play, which is apparently the issue was fine. And, and if you're on the lead card, now that I'm trying to defend it, I mean, it's slower. It's slower. They got to wait for all the, 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 the fans get, yeah. at, you know, you're, you're well, constantly there's waiting. No behind us either. There's, there's no one we're backing up. Um, I mean, now we're playing for a lot more money. The titles are bigger. It just, yeah. these, these shots mean a lot. And, I don't personally think I'm abusing the rule at all. I, I don't go up to a 15 footer and take 45 seconds. I'm actually, I feel like a pretty reasonable player when it comes to putting honestly now where you've gotten a lot faster. That, that is 20 for sure. second range. I mean, I played with Yuli a couple of times. I'm sure he can defend me a little bit here, but uh, I, I just well, go ahead. I think the problem is here is, is you are getting targeted. You're getting yep. targeted by, by the officials, of course, because of your reputation for taking a long time in the past. And that's something that's only going to go away with years and years and years of playing and being a quick player, which you've already gotten past it. And we're all talking about how fast you are at this point in time. So you're getting to that point. Um, I do think that this, this is also an unwritten rule in disc golf that we're talking about because not all the time we have officials on your card that are going to um, call you on this stuff. But like for myself, for example, I take over the time limit from time to time. I do. Do I ever get called on it? No but I'm not known for being a slow putter. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah, just, and if, and if Brody's on my card and he's taking a long time on a shot, I'm never going to call it. And does that mean that I'm like uh, a, a rules guy or not a rules guy? No, 
But so people like online, when you have the keyboard for warriors of them being like, no, you have to call it all the time. No, you don't. That's not true in any way. But if they are going to crack down, like on the lead card situations of you doing this, then they do need to call it all the time Yes, because you aren't holding up the tournament and they're holding you accountable for something that pace of play is the whole reason that they need to do this. Right. Yeah. And then then like the other thing I kind of like almost ties into that too is, you know, there's been those situations, let's just say, where a shot, you don't know if it crossed in bounds or not, but they don't let you use video evidence. And their excuse for that is because they don't have cameras on whatever, the fourth, fifth, yeah. sixth cards. Why would that not apply to the 30-second rule as well? Because a player, There's not a marshal on every card. Yeah, yeah. there's not a marshal on every card, but yeah. I was called by a marshal, not a player. And so... Point. Why would that not apply to the same rule? It's just I don't I don't it's, it's I don't definitely like, frustrating. Yeah, and I don't like the idea like here's the thing. I'm going to I'm going to say it like it is. I think sometimes these people just want to be in on the action. They want to be on coverage. They want to put themselves in here. What a marshal should do is not follow the lead card. What a marshal should do is Wander. monitor the entire tournament. Mm-hmm. You're not the tournament is not just the lead card. It's the entire thing. And so the fact that they don't do that, that is a big, huge misstep. And I'm just going to call out the marshals and say, maybe it is they want to be on coverage. Maybe it is they want to be there and they want to insert themselves into a situation where they're not inserting themselves into a situation on hole four when it's, uh, you know, the, the third card out or the fifth card out. They're inserting themselves in when the coverage is there. They're on cameras. Not a fan, not a fan. Um, but I do want to move on, Gannon, because we have Luke coming in at the top of the hour, and I still have a lot more questions I want to ask you. Yes. Um, a lot of people brought this up, and I'm curious. Watching coverage on hole 18, I was I was a little shocked with how many people were like, what the heck, he shouldn't be allowed to do that. What are your thoughts on being able to use your phone um, as – you know, and again, this was like a weird one because you just, yeah. I, I've played with you. I know you're the first person to like throw a shot and be like, is that 10 feet? Is that 15 feet? Is like, you want to know how far it is. And that's all you were doing. There wasn't really an advantage of you knowing if you're 20 feet or 30 feet away, what you were going to do was, was, uh, was not, it wasn't going to change, but what are your thoughts on being able to use your phone to watch coverage or, or whatnot? Is that, is that a big, not such a big deal? People are just blowing it out of proportion. I, I didn't even know people were talking about it because yeah, I got a lot of tweets. Be anything wrong with it? Like I, mean, I don't know. I I definitely video evidence, person. dude. You're not allowed to use that. Oh no, <laughs> you caught me. Uh, I don't know. That's that's an interesting one. I don't, I mean I don't see how it could possibly be bad. I don't know. I just want to. I don't know. It's it was only because it was a blind shot. Like yeah. If it's you're a, if it's a, I'm you're not just looking curious. at my phone if it's a wide open hole and I see where I land. It's what like, are you like a Gen Z? What, what what's your what are you technically? Uh, I don't even know. What are, you're you you got you need stuff instantaneous, right? Like you have to you can't yeah. wait. You, you know, patience is a tough thing for you. You want to know right now where you at. So I yeah, will say I like, it is it is like a it, it doesn't look great, but neither does hacky sack or playing tic tac toe in the dirt. There's tons of things in disc golf that don't look great. Until they change the rule of where we can't use our phones or we can't yeah. wear headphones while we play, people can do whatever they want. Yeah, I, I think I just like wanted to be. I was just anxious, you know, the, the whole situation. I just want to be like mentally prepared to know what I had coming up. I think um, it's smart. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, think it's, can, I think if it's you very can smart. Use it, why not? Yeah. Well, let's talk. Let's, you, oh, go ahead. Because you walk. There's it, a big difference between being like, okay, I think I'm 20 feet. That seemed pretty good, and getting up there and you're 42 feet. Yeah, it's a confidence destroyer. Yeah, or being at being like, okay, I'm at um, 40 feet, and then you got 30 footer. It's a big. There's a big time difference there. If you can get, if you can visualize that whole time walking up for a winning putt, you've taken a lot of the stress already out of it when you step up there. So, I I, I definitely tell all my caddies like, do not, do not say (laughs) anything about a shot. Don't say that it's inbound. Don't say that you're parked. Don't do anything. Cause the worst thing ever is like, Oh dude, you're parked. And then you get up there and it's like 24 feet. Yeah. And you're like, it puts that thought in your head of like, yeah. you already made it. And then you have to think, <laughs> and you're like, well, I, I, my, my caddy said I deserve the birdie basically. <laughs> yeah. And now I gotta work for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about the spit out here. So this happened kind of in the middle of the round. I want to say final round 11. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whole 11. Um, 
What do you have to say to all the people that are saying you're putting too hard? I don't think it was too hard at all. I actually, it wasn't that hard of a putt. Um, it like, it wasn't even like on the pole. I mean, it was like the right side of the pole. It wasn't even like on like the dead center of the pole. Mm -hmm. And it's like coming down into the basket. I, I think it just like, like once it hit the chains and then the, obviously the chains get like kind of sucked up from the bottom. It like, just like caught one of the chains and then flipped it out. It was just I mean, unfortunate. I mean, I've seen worse spit outs with a lot less pace. I mean, we've seen Isaac putt on baskets like that at two miles an hour, and the same thing happens. Like, it, I mean, I, I, honestly, I thought that was a pretty fair putt. I didn't jam it that hard. It wasn't really windy, so I didn't putt it that hard. It was a firm putt, but I don't think it was anything crazy. Do you think that uh, you have more spit outs than anybody? Um. Ooh, that's a good no, question. Be, no, because I don't put on a lot of hyzer. I feel like a lot of people that put on like a lot of hyzer can spit. I, I see a lot of spit throughs. How many? How many I mean, putts Gossage, do you think? Gossage has a spit out every single round I play with him. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> like literally every round I play with him, Gossage has a spit out. Do you think you have a spit out a round or a spit out a tournament? I, I, I'd say like it depends on the baskets, uh, but if it's a solid basket, I mean one spit out a tournament hmm. a yeah. lot of spit outs but that here's is, the thing this is what people <laughs> here's the thing that people need to realize i think your your putt has too much pace to for spit outs i think and you have a, a great pace a to be able yeah to be able to make putts from everywhere i think your putts you're the best putter in the world in my opinion I mean, his, his stats but, showed that he putted better than yeah. anyone this week. So I feel by, like it's by five or something. <laughs> I feel like you don't, cha you don't change it. Right. No, no, no. But my, my point is also that people have to realize is you're making more putts than anybody. You're going to have more chances for spit outs as well. That's a good mm. point. That is a you're good point. You have more opportunities for spit outs. You're not I'm airballing done. as much as yeah. all of us are. <laughs> yeah. Or hitting the been, basket. Yeah. I've been like too tentative in the past of like, people saying I putt too hard and stuff like that. And then when I try to putt softer, I don't even hit the chains. So like, yeah. I don't even get a chance to even have a spit out <laughs> or stay in the basket. So in my mind, I'm just like, Hey, I know a spit out's a risk. I know it's going to happen. Obviously I threw my hands up. It's still unfortunate. Like yes. that a spit out happens. It's never like super deserving, but I do have a higher risk and it doesn't help. My putters are really stiff that can also none of the energy gets lost when it hits something like that. It kind of just shoots yeah, that it back. Looked like, that looked like it literally hit a brick wall. When I watched it, it looked yeah. like it did, uh, did, did it affect your putt on the next hole? Cause you missed completely left and almost airballed it. Were you thinking yeah. like, I got to put this in a little softer or I mean, was just the confidence gone in general? Cause there is something to having momentum, making a birdie yeah. and being 40 feet and be like, all right, this is easy. It was just like a really bad stretch for me. Cause I threw a really good drive in hole nine after I was already in control of the tournament being six through eight. Um, and I had time for the league going into the round. So I was, I was feeling amazing. And I had like 180. No, no, I was not sure. I had like 200 into the green on hole nine, which is like just outside my jump putt range. I, I, there was a little bit of wind, so I didn't want to do it. Uh, if it was like 180, I probably would have, but I, there's that little OB Creek. I just was kind of scared about, and I just seen Luke go forehand. So I tried going forehand and Sexton did it as well. And I just got like a dud skip on the hill. Um, so, you know, I, I, and then I missed my circle two putt there, just a couple inches low. Um, obviously then got the time warning on hole 10, then got the dead center spit on 11, then threw OB on 12, then hit the first tree on 13. So I had a bad stretch there. Um, yeah, I, I think it definitely a little bit affected it. Um, just cause there's that pressure of like, Oh crap. I have to make this putt to just stay one back even because Nick is on the course, just shredding. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously Luke is slowly coming up. I think he went like five down where I went even in that stretch. Mm -hmm. So just mm -hmm. like snap of a finger is it's all tied up basically. again. I'm, I'm even down. Um, so yeah, I mean, that putt was a little, a little tentative. It also was a death putt too. If I, if I airball it or something or get a bad reaction off the, the top or the cage or something like that. So that was a little scary. Um, but yeah, after, after that hole, I felt like my whole world fell apart. <laughs> Let's talk. Yeah. You, oh, go ahead. You like, go. Oh, I was going to skip ahead a little bit, but if you have something in the middle, 
Uh, I have something for Nick Loss. I want to know his thoughts about Nick Loss. Okay. Yeah. You may the do that first. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. We're not talking about that. Oh, okay. um, we'll talk about that in a second. Or after you're gone, we're going to talk about backwards. Okay. Um, no, I want, I want to know your thoughts on his play on hole 17. So he definitely looked like he was a little bit fearful of the, and we've seen people take massive numbers on that hole. If you never cross in bounds, you throw it over the water. Everyone's throwing it over the water, never cross in bounds. It's pretty much an automatic re because you only would advance a couple feet up and then you have a much worse kind of run up. So everyone was reteeing. It looked like he was pretty cautious about that and just kind of early released it out to the left. And he was left with like about a 40 footer on a putt that, you know, he's playing really, really well. He was putting really, really well. What are your thoughts on him laying up there? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost a lose, lose scenario unless you make the putt because you can lay it up and I don't know. And then if you don't win, maybe you lose by a shark. You're like, dang, why did I not run it? You could run the putt. Then you roll OB and you're like, dang, I should have laid it up. Or if you could run the putt, you make it and then you're happy and you're happy. You got that stroke back. Um, I personally think he should have ran the putt with how good he was playing and there was no wind. Um, that's just like a, a, a putt that, you know, if you want to win championships, you got to make that kind of a putt. Um, Are you, you running know? that putt? If you guys, if he was, if he was in your spot and you're now here and you've got Nicholas kind of, you know, I, I think at that point you guys were maybe two or three holes behind them. So you uh, still had a lot of holes left. It, it, I mean, honestly, it depends on how I'm playing. It depends on the conditions. Like, I mean, it, it was super calm that day. I think it's one of those putts where, I kind of tell my caddy, you know, I'll, I'll lay it up if I feel like it, but if I really think I can make this putt, I'm going to run it. Um, and to him, he didn't even think about it. I, yeah. I, I, if I was in his shoes, I would have taken some time to think about it because he's good enough to where he can make that putt. I think 50% of the time. You, and, were you shocked that he laid that up? I was without, with how good he was playing. But at the same time, when you think about the closing holes, yeah, like the lead card would have had a good, he had a big lead. And yep. they would have had to go on a shredder. And my, well, I was more surprised about the whole 18 play. If you lay that putt up, you got to get hyper aggressive on 18 and try to yeah. birdie that thing. Because if, mm-hmm. like, if you go up the middle, you can get a lot more distance up there, which is what I would have done. I would have tried to go for the flex gap up the middle or a roller or something to get myself way up there to try to get birdie. And he went with the hyzer play, which leaves him 500 in, even if he throws a good, a really good one. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where I'm at with it. I think he should have got more aggressive on 18 because even if you hit those trees, you can pitch up, take par, get out of there. Um, but instead he left himself with like probably 480 and in, into the pin on 18. Yeah, it definitely. It definitely looked like he was kind of banking on you not being able to finish birdie birdie. Yeah. And you know, those are 17, 18 or not, uh, you know, auto birdies, probably not for you either. Did you birdie? Did you birdie either one of those on the first round out there at Lake Waco? No, it was also like pitch black windier. and super windy. Yeah. Yeah. We were, just, we, were, we were the third card. So chase card was the last card to finish. So we were, it was pretty dark when we played it. And we had like a 20, 25 mile per hour gusts left to right wind. And it, I, I had like a, I had like a 20, I had like a 25 footer and I hit off the band. It was so windy. It was a straight headwind. I putted it, hit the band, almost came back to me. Um, just flew full fly back to me and then <laughs> and then 18 i remember like i threw my shot and then i was like barely even off the tee pad and Corey Ellis just rips his shot we just wanted to get off the course um and then i i i almost did birdie it i i threw a big hyzer on the second shot th- during that second round and uh actually got stuck by the tree that's like 50 short of the basket yeah and it, it hit the tree so it was coming in like like it probably would hit pretty close to the basket and skipped a little bit long, but hit the tree. So it, it didn't, didn't that, skip. That was the one that you were yelling, get over, get over on your, your final shot. Yeah. But it, that was, yeah. Round two is what I'm talking about, but yeah, yeah I'm that's, saying that's, the fi- the final round, you were yelling, get over it, get yeah, over yeah. it. I was in that a very was... similar position to that. And I, I mean, it was dark outside. That's like, we kind of just chucked it up there. I was like, get my par, get out. Yeah. Uh, whatever. No, no big deal. If I get a birdie cool. Um, but yeah. But, yeah. Sweet. Uh, All right, so let's let's move ahead, to like... hole 16. You miss your long putt. Luke makes it. Momentum's on his side now. 
And then he just absolutely bases 17. You get that unfortunate, maybe fortunate role. At that point in time, did you think that you had lost the tournament? I, yeah, I actually turned around and like did that. And I started walking back to my bag uh, because I saw it get up and roll. I'm like, that's OB. <laughs> and then walking up to your putt, and he's still parked, so he's going to have a one stroke lead anyway. Yeah. Were you uh, were you pretty confident you were going to make it, or was it like, I guess I got to just rip this at it and hope for the best? Or, or... I don't know. In, in my mind, like, uh, duh, obviously there's those doubts, but it's also like I'm given this putt right now. Like, it's almost just poetic. I have to make it. And I put it dead center, perfect pace. And, you know, I, I, I knew that would – I knew – and that putt's huge for multiple reasons because it makes him, it makes him have to think on 18 a little bit more. If he's up two on me, yeah, on 18 he can like for sure just play for par. Uh, and then you know Nicholas is in the clubhouse and he can't get any more under par. He's, you know, it's not yeah. like he has another hole to play like I would. Um, and so it, 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 I mean everything I think just worked out perfectly in my favor. I mean it's never over till it's over. I kept telling myself that. Uh, after 13, I, I was like, you got to get most of these birdies, if not all of them. And then I got that break with Nick Loss throwing an OB on 17. And my caddy was like, Nick Loss is going to bogey. I'm like, okay, we're still in it. So it's going to be pretty tight, actually, because I, I kind of counted on birdie 17. I, I felt like it was a, it's a pretty easy, pretty easy tee shot. Um, it's wide open, 375, no wind. We should be executing that most of the time. All right, we'll finish it off here with a fan of yours. I'm assuming it's a, a mega <laughs> fan because they're calling you the GOAT. Gannon Burr <laughs> winning the Waco tournament. I think it's great that after leaving Prodigy, you won the tournament sponsored by them. How did it feel facing off against your old teammate now that you're on a new team? Um, well, it's it's definitely interesting. Uh, Luke has, hasn't been in that position uh, too much. So uh, it's a, it's a little bit, it's, it's, it's definitely scary because, you know, when you, when you see him play so good and hit that putt on 16 and uh, I'm really good friends with Luke. Uh, so it, it was just like a, it was a fun round. We, we talked the round. It was a, it was a great battle. Um, and then, you know, obviously winning with my new disc mania bag, it was just so awesome. And it kind of, you know, proves to everyone proves to myself that I can win with these discs already. And we're only two tournaments in. Um, and I mean, really the only reason I, I didn't win chess.com was cause I didn't putt good. Um, throwing was really good there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it was just so such a, such a great battle. It's right up there with USCGC in terms of my favorite wins, just because the way I oh, wow. won it, I guess nice. it is also my second biggest win of being an elite plus win. Mm -hmm. So that's uh that's huge for me. Sweet. All right. Well, Gan, thank you so much for joining Tour Life. You're always welcome. Uh, your 2024 Waco champion, Gannon Burr. Uh, we'll see you down in Austin, brother. All right. Thank you, guys.